Welcome everyone, welcome at the Bali and welcome to this program and also for the people watching at home a very warm welcome. My name is Zara Toxus, I'm program maker at the Bali and I will moderate this evening with the big question, how should Europe respond to Russian aggression? And it has been three months since Russia invaded Ukraine and the future is still unclear. What is needed to stop the war in Ukraine? And what do countries bordering Russia, such as Belarus, need? That's what we're going to discuss tonight and we'll do this with a Belarusian politician, a Georgian journalist and two Dutch politicians. And this is the last program of So Far Yet So Close, a day organized in cooperation with the Dutch Belarusian diaspora. And we spoke with Belarusian activists, artists and journalists and you can watch everything back at our website thebali.nl. And tonight it's all about geopolitics and I would like to introduce my first guest. And on my left is Franak Fiatorka, a Belarusian politician, a journalist, a senior advisor to Svetlana Tikhanovskaya, who uh, would most probably have won the elections of 2020 in Belarus if there wouldn't be any fraud. Welcome to you. And on my right, Natalia Antelava, Georgian journalist, co-founder of Coda Story, a news platform uh, specialized in crisis reporting, and I advise everyone to check it out because they have very interesting pieces. You are a former BBC correspondent. Uh, you have a lot of experience in the Middle East, Central Asia, and the Caucasus. A very warm welcome to you also. Uh, we have in the second part the politicians joining uh, Thijs Reute via, uh, via Zoom, but he's already hearing everything, so just so you know that he's mm -hmm. keeping up with the story. <laughs> uh, I want to start with you. You are uh, a journalist for a long time. You know a lot about uh, this topic and also especially about disinformation, information uh, war. At this moment, it seems as everyone is suddenly jumping into this topic. How does it feel for you? Isn't it a bit annoying that maybe it's a bit too late that people are now very much interested in this? Or how do you see this? Um, it's a bit annoying, but uh, I, look, it does feel like a completely, I mean, we're obviously living in, in um, unprecedented, really historic times. And I think for a lot of people, it has come, I think many people have made a lot of realizations. Um, I said it earlier today, I'll say it again. Um, you know, the view for me as a journalist who has covered a lot of these places and a lot of what's going on, and as a Georgian as well, um, I wish it did not have to come to this, and I don't think it had to come to this if, um, you, you know, if things had been uh, slight, dealt slightly differently. Um, so that's the probably the frustrating thing. You know, one of the things uh, when... Uh, Putin launched this latest and completely insane invasion um, of Ukraine. It was uh, really interesting to hear how many of my colleagues and just friends from the region, um, you know, we sort of were all calling each other. And so many of them said, remember that red button? And I don't think it's something that anyone in the West necessarily remembers, but the red button was the button that Hillary Clinton presented to Sergei Lavrov um, just months after Russia invaded Georgia. And the button said, reset on it. Uh, they managed, the Obama administration people managed to misspell reset in Russian. So that caused a lot of giggles and laughter. Uh, but I think everyone who was watching that in, in, the, in the region, in neighboring countries, in the Baltics, um, I don't think anyone laughed because, uh, you know, watching Lavrov laugh at the reset, um, we all thought, wow, they, they just got away with it. And since then, I think Russia has been allowed to get away uh, with literally murder, um, you know, in Georgia, but then in Crimea, in eastern Ukraine, um, in Syria, in so many other, in, in the UK, in Europe, where, you know, we've had poisonings and assassinations and so on. So I think this is an opportunity. Um, the cost is incredibly high, it's too high, but so is the responsibility, I think, 
What do you not mean? to waste uh, the opportunity. Uh, okay. What do you mean? The cost is high. The cost of human lives and mm -hmm. people who are paying with their lives for mm -hmm. um, things that I think could have been avoidable. Yeah. We're going to talk much more about uh, uh, Georgia also. Uh, uh, Franak via Chorka, you fight uh, for free elections for a free Belarus to stop the tyranny in Be Belarus. Um, it's also a personal conflict because you have friends in jail. Uh, I also saw on your Twitter page you, you tweet a lot about uh, friends, people you know who are in jail. What's the influence of the of this personal aspect of, of the fight, uh, yeah, of your fight? Many people are in jail, but many people are also in the Ukrainian army fighting for uh, Ukrainian freedom as well. Uh, it's spectacular how quickly Belarusians reacted when Russia invaded Ukraine. Of course, on one hand, there were collaborators, uh, along with Lukashenko, who provided Putin with the territory, with the infrastructure, with the airfields. But uh, ordinary people, activists, uh, former journalists, they uh, moved to Ukraine, created a battalion. Today, this battalion announced that they are growing and becoming a regiment. So now there will be two battalions united in regiment. And uh, several people from the office of Slana Tsikhanovskaya also joined this battalion. And now they are fighting and they are risking their lives. There's uh, a lot of solidarity. It's a lot of solidarity, but also a lot of self-sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And um, I think for us, the victory of Ukraine became uh, something uh, crucial for our own victory. We don't separate um, this, this fight for uh, Ukrainian uh, freedom from our fight. Yes, before, um, during our revol revolution in 2020 and protests before, we hoped that it's possible to make these changes, uh, to make the revolution like Georgia's, uh, Georgians managed in 2004, right? Like it's Ukrainians managed in 2013-14. Uh, to, to, but, but right now, unfortunately, we became hostage somehow by geopolitical reality, we can't ignore anymore. Mm -hmm. And just uh, going back to uh, political opponents who are in jail, I also saw on your Twitter page that you can send postcards to people in jail. So do I understand it correctly that there is some form of uh, contact that you or people can have with people who are in jail in Belarus? Uh, absolutely. And even more, I will show you today that Dasha has made. So she, uh, this is my best friend, Tihar Losik. He got 14 years in prison, and you see, it's a, a Dutch uh, post uh, stamp. Oh, that's great. Uh, which works. Uh, and uh, Iher, my friend, will receive uh, the postcards with a uh, stamp with his own portrait. And I think it will be very nice. Also, I have Sergei Tsikhanovsky, a husband of uh, yeah. Stalin Tsikhanovsky. I will see her tomorrow, and she will be very pleased to see the stamp. And I also have here uh, Masha Kalesnikova, the one who was showing during the revolution this uh, hard yeah. sign. And um, sending postcards, it becomes uh, the um, very small but available to everyone step that can help. Of course, we know that uh, many postcards will not be allowed. Of course, we know that uh, postcards will be delayed by months or two. But even the fact of writing the postcard, it is important for person who writes. Same as for those uh, to whom you yes. write. So this is something we ask people, and today, Belarusian Human Rights Defenders, they announced Day of Belarusian Political Prisoners. There are 1,200 of them. So mm -hmm. if you, you still have three hours, uh, but it's okay to send tomorrow as well and next week, it would be great to send um, a few words of solidarity, support that you are not abandoned, you are not alone. And um, when I was um, in isolation in, in army, it was also a sort of uh, uh, in, in prison, in, cons in consideration. Uh, for me, uh, reading postcards and letters was only fun in life. Mm -hmm. And for many political prisoners receiving these letters, that's the only thing they, that bring them joy, that gives them energy and hope. You can spend the whole day reading letters and writing responding letters. So please do this if you can. Thank you. That's a good call to action because I think, uh, let's say, normal citizens also wonder a lot what they can do. So this is something. Thank you. We are going to talk about what's happening now and what we or what uh, Europe should do, but I want to take a little step back. Maybe some of you were joining the other programs during the day, but there also might be new 
people. Uh, so if we're talking about the invasion of Ukraine, you mentioned it a bit, but did you see it coming? <coughs> Uh, well, I, uh, I admitted at an earlier session that um, I was wrong about it. I mm -hmm. did not think it would happen. I assumed that they would attack the east. I was very skeptical about all the claims that they would go for Kiev, so I was wrong. And so were lots of my friends who, you know, are often right about things. Um, so I, you know, I was sure there would be another um, a flare-up, and mm -hmm. it looked like there would be a very serious flare-up. Um, I did not think that it would be quite as insane as what we've seen in February and through March and so on. Um, and I think, um, you know, I slightly blame myself for not seeing that because, uh, you know, when, when it started happening, it, there was a feeling that you're, oh, you know, we've seen this all before. And, and uh, you know, it really raises some really interesting question about our own memories and our own relationship with historic memory, especially vis-a-vis -vis Russia. Um, I was talking to a Georgian friend uh, recently, a colleague, who said that uh, they were, it's a Georgian newsroom that was recently contacted by Ukrainians, uh, and they were asked um, uh, what um, uh, they were asked if there were any examples of war crimes that the Georgians could provide to them of Russian war crimes. So they started digging into it, and you know, unraveled quite a few instances, both in the wars in the 90s, where Russia, using very similar scenarios that they did in eastern Ukraine of kind of creating the separatist regions, getting people to fight each other and so on, created this enclaves within Georgia. Um, and then from some examples from 2008. Um, and uh, as a result of that, this week there will be an exhibition in Tbilisi um, around the war crimes, Russian war crimes, and so on. But it was um, in in a small kind of conversation with these Georgians, and we are, you know, sort of the people who tend to stay on top of the agenda. It was striking to all of us how little processing of that sort of historic crimes that Russia has committed there has been, and um, how we ourselves have brushed them off and kind of normalized, it, normalized them. Um, so I think there is a lot of reckoning that is happening now between the countries, in, inside the communities, inside people, and I think Ukraine has triggered a lot of really painful but incredibly important conversations. And, you know, as you say, I think it's existential for uh, for everyone who is living in the region. And, you know, it's the same, you know, in Georgia, it's very much perceived as, you know, kind of, a, a quote, unquote, our war. Um, but I think it's also really important that it is seen outside of the region as an existential struggle between... Um, uh, between freedom and tyranny, uh, mm -hmm. because I think what, that's what we are seeing. And uh, I often think back when I was covering the war in 2014, 2015, and you know I would um, spend time with the Ukrainian troops. Um, I would spend time on both sides, and I was when I was spending time with the Ukrainian troops. Often these, you know, young 19, 20, 22 year old boys who have left young men who had left their uh, jobs in Kiev and signed up to fight. Um, and you would ask them, what, what are you fighting for? And they would say, I'm fighting for Europe. Um, and they were shocked then that Europe didn't realize that they were fighting for them. Um, and I think it's really important to make sure that Europeans realize it now. Yes, that's... Well, let's see what Europeans think about that <laughs> later. Uh, you mentioned already the invasion uh, of Georgia in 2008 in the uh, uh, Abkhazia and Ossetia regions. Let's go to that invasion because I did some, I tried to do some research to see what uh, the reaction of European Union was back at the time, but I could find not a lot, and actually I only saw that it ended with a, a ceasefire, uh, some kind of um, a peace agreement between uh, Shakashvili and uh, uh, Sarkozy was there, and maybe, I don't know, Putin or Medvedev, and then some kind of plan with some points, and then, okay, that's it. Uh, can you take us back a bit and tell us something about uh, the reaction of Europe and the European Union back then on Putin's aggression? 
Yeah, the, um, the most consequential reaction, and I think it paved the way to Crimea and to what happened in Ukraine uh, next, uh, was basically, as I said earlier, it came from the US, but the same was mm -hmm. in Europe, it was to let Russia get away with it. And there was a lot of pressure on uh, the Georgian government to let Russia get away with it. And then uh, there was also a lot of, um, you know, the narrative. Uh, it's almost the West did not protect the narrative. It started off, everything started off I mean, obviously badly because it was an invasion, mm -hmm. but it also started with very healthy reactions from the Europeans. European leaders came to Tbilisi. They were, you know, in the middle of the square with uh, addressing thousands of people. Um, Sarkozy was negotiating and so on. But eventually, Georgia was pushed into signing uh, signing an agreement. Um, and... Uh, Possibly it was, I mean, we don't need to go into the details whether it was the right thing to do or not, but I mean, it was a, the ceasefire was obviously right and necessary and Georgian army, I mean, it's just, you know, impossible to stand up to the Russians with, when the country is as small as that. And it was clear that, um, you know, NATO would not come to Georgia's defense. But what happened afterwards that was incredibly um, consequential was that the Russians succeeded at crafting a narrative that put the blame for the invasion on Georgia. Mm -hmm. And the main source of that re uh, narrative was, in fact, the report um, that was published by the, you know, the European Union, the EU investigation, and the report that, that came out of that investigation that sort of, you know, created a lot of doubt uh, and uh, a lot of... Mm, uh, room for for blaming blaming the victim. Mm -hmm. Russia was not sanctioned or was not punished. No, the the Russia was not sanctioned or punished. No, and the administration changed in Washington. Uh, Russia was definitely not sanctioned or punished by the European Union, and um, the European Union wanted to put it away and forget about it. Mm -hmm. And. Um, you know, the administration changed in Washington, Obama came to power, and he wanted a fresh start with Russia. So everyone moved on. And because everyone moved on, we got Crimea and Ukraine, and we have, and, and Syria, and uh, we have, you know, we're seeing what we're seeing now. But what do you think was Russia's tactic if you're saying they put the blame on Georgia? Like what, how did they do this? What what strategy is behind this? Was there a strategy? Can we see the same strategy now? Like, what was the... I think it's a lot more difficult now because um, I think the, both the stakes are higher. Uh, Ukraine is closer. People are more familiar. They're incredible communicators, um, including mm -hmm. Zelensky. Their message is very clear. Um, uh, it has gone on for longer. And they also, they handled it very smartly from the start. Um, with in the case with Georgia, you know they did what they uh, Russians did what they uh, the Russian government did what they always do very well. They looked for vulnerabilities and the weak points, and they really, uh, you know, really pressed on them. And um, you know, Russian uh, there is there is both chaos and cohesiveness to Russian disinformation and propaganda. Um, and, you know, I was saying earlier, in many ways, it's like throwing spaghetti <laughs> on the wall and seeing what sticks. And, you know, they use the weaknesses of both character and uh, arguments to build their own argument of and, and, and kind of saw doubt in the European debate, in the Western debate, about whether or not Georgia, um, you know, what role Georgia played in all of it, which when you think back of it, to it is, is ridiculous, uh, mm -hmm. right? Georgia was invaded, like that was clear. Um, but, you know, I mean, one very extreme example, a tiny but a telling example uh, was, um, you know, Georgian president at the time, Mikhail Saakashvili, who is in jail now, uh, in, in, imprisoned in Tbilisi. He's a very eccentric figure that, um, it can be easily, it's easy to dislike him, uh, which Russia has always manipulated. And um, at one point during an interview, in preparation on the interview, as the country was being invaded, he chewed on his tie. And um, that, 
the the backstory is that the the Russians managed to buy the footage from the crew that actually kept rolling when he was doing that. And to this day, whenever you see him on Russian TV, um, it's almost guaranteed it's the it's the picture of him chewing the tie. Mm -hmm. And the way they used it also in Western narratives to really portray him as a total madman, mm -hmm. uh, which he was not. Eccentric, absolutely. Madman, no. Um, you know, was uh, was incredibly effective. So, and it's from these little bricks, this is just a one tiny example, but it's from these little bricks that, you know, the, the narrative gets created. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, they they did that. They Do you, uh, Franak, recognize these tactics of seeking for the vulnerabilities and the weaknesses and exploiting these in uh, using them, creating an, an, a new narrative? In Belarus, uh, they uh, use identity issue because uh, Belarus uh, was the most crucified country among all Soviet Union states. Uh, we came into the Soviet Union with 90% of people speaking Belarusian and 95% of schools in Belarusian language. And we ended in Soviet Union with only about 10, 14% of schools and right now still the same number. And the number of population speaking Belarusian is very uh, small. Uh, all writers, intelligentsia, all those who create um, national products, uh, they were basically first killed in the Stalin times, and they they were uh, forced into exile by Lukashenko. Uh, famous writers like Vasil Biko, who was writing a lot about war, uh, he had to um, he ended his life in exile because he was against Lukashenko, and um, Russia along with Lukashenko. Lukashenko, his collaborationist regime in Belarus, they managed to russify the nation to make them very similar, uh, to dominate information space by Russian pop culture, Russian literature. Uh, most of uh, publishers were from Russia in Belarus. And uh, this helped them to control Belarus till the very last years, till 2020, when Belarusians, primarily thanks to internet, they realize that they're not Russians, they're not Soviet, they have their own identity, history, culture, language, flags, uh, heroes. And the uh, revolution of 2020, it was on one hand, of course, it was about free and fair election, but it was also about uh, uh, national uprising. Mm -hmm. uh, we uh, finally uh, grew up uh, to understanding that we are independent sovereign nation, and it was hated by uh, Putin, it was surprising for Lukashenko. They still are living in the 90s, believing that Belarusians are same Russians and trying to convince the whole world in this. And suddenly it's not. And um, in 2020, uh, Russia uh, gave hand to Lukashenko, saved him. Uh, they provided him with propagandists. First, uh, a uh, group of uh, so-called journalists from Russia today um, landed in Minsk uh, first weeks after, uh, first week actually, mm -hmm. first weekend after a revolution has started. In August. Um, yeah. In yeah. August 2020, uh, because many journalists left state television propaganda channels. Then they prepared the groups of Russian soldiers on the border with uh, Belarus, ready to, to be deployed. And um, it didn't happen in the end, but it was everything was prepared. And um, uh, in case of Belarus, their only the ally, the only guarantee of control over Belarus right now is Lukashenko, who is who built the whole power vertical system for himself. And uh, until Lukashenko is in power, Russia will be in control. And therefore, they're so um, uh, friendly. They are meeting so often. And Putin gives uh, so much attention and support to Lukashenko. No, it's not that different than Georgia, actually, because uh, Georgia is different. The cultural and historical background is different because Georgia always had a very strong uh, independence movement, always hung on to the language. People spoke the language and so on. But what, um, what the Russians failed to do in 2008 by invading uh, Georgia, and the goal was to take Tbilisi, there is all evidence that points to that, um, it was to take Tbilisi and get rid of uh, Saakashvili's government. They managed to do um, in 2012 elections when they used um, a Georgian oligarch, who, but really a Russian oligarch, because he made all of his money in Russia, mm -hmm. to, um, you know, s 
run a campaign against the government and um, he got elected. Um, the party Georgian Dream came to power. Um, and it's impossible for a politician to, in Georgia to be openly pro-Russian because the population is so anti-Russian uh, to this day. Um, and yet, uh, you know, the country visibly changed its sort of geopolitical course while paying lip service to um, uh, the European um, values and European ambitions and um, and so on. It has, um, you know, rolled back uh, freedom of speech and freedom, um, all sorts of uh, all sorts of things. There's been a lot of democratic backsliding. Just a couple of days ago, um, one of the you know ahead of a major opposition TV station went to jail. Um, and um, as long as you know that oligarch is in in charge, he's de facto in charge, he doesn't hold an um, official position, then Russia has Georgia basically pretty much sorted, uh, right? They don't, they don't need to invade. So there is, it's, it's really interesting how what, what, I, what I think we see happening, there is like a real gap between the people and the government, and the government. in both countries where, yeah, there's completely different thinking. For us, Georgia still is uh, a big democracy, and uh, yeah, compared to Belarus, of course, uh, with of course uh, you have your your problem, your story, but for many Belarusian organizations and media, Georgia became the safe haven, and uh, in contrast to other Caucasus uh, countries. Uh, Georgia is uh, very friendly. It's not because of uh, government, it's because of society, which is very friendly. But uh, it's the, the third largest center of Belarusian exiled organizations after Poland, Lithuania, and then Georgia, Batumi and Tbilisi, and we are very thankful for this. And um, also, I think this independence movement and in general Georgian you know, tradition of uh, freedom fighting, they, uh, it inspires a lot of Belarusians as well. You yourself are uh, exiled in Lithuania, if I'm correct. Yeah, yeah, really. And in 2020, these protests started in Minsk. When did the opposition ask for international help? Uh, immediately, immediately, mm -hmm. because on August 9, when um, uh, results were clear that Lukashenko is losing, Slanskanovska is winning, uh, she receives about uh, 60, 70 percent or more. Um, uh, people started to gather on the streets mm -hmm. and the uh, riot police, KGB, uh, special forces, they started to use grenades, shoot people. Uh, many were injured. Uh, they switched off internet. Uh, it was like a coup d'etat mm -hmm. by the guy who, who just uh, refused to, to step down. Mm -hmm. uh, Lukashenko built the only working uh, thing in his uh, 28 years career. It's the law enforcement. It's the uh, security apparatus with many agencies, many officers, uh, or agency that control another agency which controls another agency. And all these thousands of people, well-trained officers, they were uh, targeting uh, protesters, journalists, activists. And uh, we asked immediately to help. We asked uh, for the help of the UN, of the European Union, OSCE you know, to stop the violence, to help to conduct free and fair elections. Uh, unfortunately, we were not hurt. Mm -hmm. uh, the support, the first sanctions were imposed only nine months after yeah. uh, elections, and this was the result of Ryanair hijacking primarily, not of the crackdown of people. Of course, um, there were many uh, words of condemnation, many statements, uh, many uh, political uh, statements, strong political statements, but uh, no one really uh, assessed, assessed the scale mm -hmm. of the terror and the scale of crisis. They thought it's like always, you know, in Belarus, uh, election, surprising, crackdown, normalization, and uh, they didn't um, uh, under, understand that it's much more serious. And uh, after 2020, the cleansing of civil society started. And therefore, right now, when war started, uh, it was very difficult to organize mass protests in support of Ukraine, because uh, all the civil societies are, are either in exile or in underground, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or in prison. Mm -hmm. You said in uh, November 2021 that the EU needs to step up its game. On the one hand, sanctions were imposed. On the other hand, Belarus still received one billion from the IMF, isn't, uh, that's a joke, isn't it? What, what, what did you expect from the 
EU. In 2021, when sanctions are imposed, Belarus had the biggest trade volume in history. So on one hand, there are sanctions. On the other hand, mm -hmm. there are loopholes. The announcement of sanctions lead to uh, growth of price, to, ri to rise in prices. And uh, the winner is Lukashenko, mm -hmm. who is selling potash oil products through the loopholes, three times more expensive than usual. And it's not only, it's many countries. Mm -hmm. Netherlands were buying, UK were buying. All those who announced sanctions, they were still buying oil products till the very end of 2021. Uh, and uh, You say, you say they, they should have stopped immediately with that. They announced the sanctions, mm -hmm. but uh, for example, they said this code of product, this code of product, and this. You know, each product has codes. What Lukashenko has done, they changed the uh, documents, put another code, and uh, half a billion Still dollars buying. products were sold through Estonia to European Union countries. So unfortunately, this inconsistency and lack of uh, enforcement institution or mechanism led to uh, sanction circumvention. And Putin and Lukashenko will be working and are working right now very actively to, to find the schemes to avoid sanctions. That's right. Um, I think it's time to um, ask uh, Ruben Brekelmans to join us because we already started the conversation about uh, the European Union, the actions of the European Union. Uh, you are a member of the Dutch Parliament for the VVD, for the VVD, and you're focused on foreign policy. Welcome to you. And via Zoom, we have Thijs Reuten, member of the European Parliament for the Dutch Labour Party, P van de A, and the shadow reporter on Belarus. Uh, for you also, a very warm welcome. Uh, I can imagine you have a very busy schedule, so I'm very happy that you can join this conversation. Uh, Ruben, Brekomans, I heard you just came back from Moldova. Uh, there are a lot of people saying Moldova is the, will be the next uh, Ukraine. What, what did you do there? What, what did you discuss? Uh, we discussed the security threats. Um, there was indeed this, this, mo this moment where Russia was, taking, uh, was, was also making progress in the south of Ukraine, uh, also moving towards Odessa. And when uh, Russia would be able to take over Odessa, then you are already at the, the border with, um, uh, with Moldova. And also there were some explosions in Transnistria, which is an a area um, kind of occupied by pro-Russian uh, pro -Russian part of the population. And also there are some Russian forces there. So there was this, this threat and this risk that maybe uh, this would be a new area uh, where uh, there would be conflict and maybe uh, Russia would try to get into Transnistria and then um, take over Moldova. Did you talk about weaponizing uh, Moldova? Uh, a little bit. So we talked about the, actually the, the weakness of the Moldovan army. Um, we, we talked to the president, the, the, the prime minister, also the, uh, other politicians, and they all told, told us that their army is very weak and that it should be strengthened. Uh, but at the same time, what I was just telling, this was a couple of weeks ago. So at the moment, there is no current threat. It seems that Russia is not strong enough to go further into the southwest and take over Odessa and then Moldova. Uh, but still, there are many hybrid threats, and of course, with propaganda, disinformation, they try to destabilize the country. Um, and second, there are still 80,000 uh, refugees, Ukrainian refugees in Moldova, uh, which is a, a huge challenge because Moldova is a poor country of only two and a half million uh, citizens. Um, and 95% of those refugees are hosted at people's uh, homes because they don't have any uh, refugees, shelters, or an asylum system like we have. So that's a, that's a big challenge for them. And third, they have a 27% inflation, uh, which is, of course, huge, even one of the highest in Europe. Uh, so these are the type of challenges that we were uh, discussing with them. And how do you listen to uh, this evening so far? Uh, what the speaker said about how Europe responded, hmm. uh, how, uh, well, actually a bit too late, uh, not enough. Yeah, mm -hmm. how do you listen to that? I, I actually, I fully agree. So um, already before the war started or before Russia invaded, um, me, me personally, but also other members of parliament for, for pushing for sanctions or to um, prepare a sanction package in order to deter Putin. 
Now, of course, we have all seen that any sanctions were, would not have been able to deter Putin. Uh, but I think in the, at the very first moment after 24th of February, the response by Europe was quite strong. There was a sanction package, a, quite a big one, was, um, uh, was, was adopted quite soon. Uh, but now we see that it's taken longer and longer, uh, longer and longer in order to increase um, and, and further strengthen the sanction package, and especially now the sixth one, which should include uh, oil. Uh, it's taken a very long time because there are two or three countries, countries that are uh, vetoing. They are vetoing that are blocking it. Uh, and I very much agree with what uh, Franak was saying about enforcing sanctions. We see it with Belarus, but also with Russia, that they are finding all sorts of loopholes. And we should be very strict in order to close those loopholes. Um, so almost any debate, uh, we are pushing our minister for that. We are also saying that make sure that you equalize the sanctions for Russia and Belarus, because we see that they are using each other in order to uh, circumvent sanctions. Uh, but unfortunately, what Franak is saying is true. Uh, they are still finding ways to, uh, to work around those sanctions, mm -hmm. making them less uh, effective. Thank you. Thijs uh, Reuten, to start with Hello. actually the, the, the same question. How do you listen so far to what's been said? Well, yes, I, I partly share what uh, Brekomans uh, just said, but I think that, um, that Europe is showing that we do learn, we do learn, but in my opinion, not fast enough. Uh, and you can uh, make a link also between the topics that were discussed before, uh, uh, what, what, what was our reaction on Georgia, what was our reaction on all the killings that happened on EU soil, uh, etc., etc. Uh, in Belarus, when the plane was hijacked in May last year, we did uh, react uh, fast. But my frustration is, is that we now see that we could have done even more, because we did more. Not enough, but we did more uh, also in uh, Russia. And I started calling for uh, further sanctions last July, last August, but it took until uh, a little before for Christmas that we uh, uh, stepped up our game uh, with Lukashenko. And of course, uh, uh, that also was another signal to Putin that you could actually do more, you could actually go one step uh, further. And now we find ourselves in this situation, and I agree with what has been said. Uh, yes, we need uh, to come uh, with the sixth package much faster. The loopholes have to be closed. But in the European Parliament, we are calling, we have been calling uh, over a month ago for a full energy boycott, a full energy boycott, mm -hmm. because um, we need to stop <coughs> financing this war. And we now find ourselves in a situation that we can still be blackmailed every day. You see it with the ruble payments. You see it uh, also uh, when, um, when some country makes a move towards NATO membership. So we should stop that vulnerability to being blackmailed. And we know that eventually, we, if we do not do it ourselves, he will have the control. Uh, Putin will have the control. So I think, and, and in, addition, in addition, we also need to continue, uh, as, as Brekelman said also, uh, with reinforcing Moldova, also with, uh, with funding, uh, but also, I think, with um, defensive uh, arrangements. We are not that far yet. But the UK announced uh, that it wants to uh, deliver weapons uh, to Moldova. Um, we spoke to uh, the president uh, of Moldova. She was in the European Parliament last week. Um, uh, so yes, we are not uh, learning our lessons fast enough, I'm afraid. <laughs> Thank you. There's some, uh, uh, yes, you first. <laughs> no, no, I, I just wanted to, to thank uh, Thuis and then Ruben, um, because uh, I think what was done in the last two years in uh, in relation to defense of democracy, human rights, and uh, fighting tyranny, it's unprecedented. Yes, on the one hand, we did not do enough and uh, uh, not fast enough, but we must also admit that many things were done unprecedentedly. And compared to Georgia 2008, you see how big progress you know, has been made. So we should also take, uh, you should take credit for this. But what is important right now, besides loopholes and uh, mechanisms, uh, unity, between EU, US, UK, Canada, big players, non-EU states, Norway, Swiss, Switzerland, and others. Because what Russia is trying to do, they're trying to find the gaps to divide, especially on oil. Mm -hmm. You know, they find the weakest link and try to, um, uh, to, div to, to make these divisions. And where we should pay attention right now, not just oil, but uh, food security, mm -hmm. exports of wheat, because this is the biggest uh, thing which can divide Europe and the West and the US right now. You see that the US wants to make a deal with Russia. Uh, we see the discussion last week in the UN 
about food security, and um, uh, they agreed partly on possible lift, lifting sanctions on Lukashenko, for example, in order to allow exports of wheat from Ukraine. Basically, uh, they are, Putin and Lukashenko, they are weaponizing food. They say, if you don't stop uh, Putin's sanctions, you will all uh, die from hunger. Mm -hmm. And this is what they sent. And they... Mono they, they um, mobilized uh, different countries in the UN, uh, from Africa, from Latin America, very dependent on deliveries and food, food supplies. And unfortunately, this is the thing we should follow very closely. And definitely, unity, 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 US and EU. Uh, we should not allow this blackmail working. We should make sure that no lifting sanctions on Lukashenko, because Putin said say that this is the only way for us to allow exports of grain from, from Ukraine. I just also want to come back to uh, the words of Thijs Reuten, some uh, strong words. Um, I also uh, uh, heard you saying before uh, that's uh, about Belarus, then the Belarusian prisoners will get their land and their freedom back. Um, uh, also strong words about Ukraine. I think that's very supportive, but maybe it's also good for us to know uh, what's your... Uh, room your space to uh, maneuver uh, within the European Union because uh, as far as I know you have to deal with the European Council uh, and in the European Council is not you but the leaders of the member states or the ministers of the member states so what's your what is your room to maneuver if, you, if you're saying we need to we need to act stronger we need to do this uh, yeah is it on you to move well, we, we do have competences as a European Parliament, uh, in, especially in also uh, safeguarding uh, the competences of the European Union in terms of the rule of law, in terms of also um, uh, some of the elements of foreign uh, policy. But it's true that in this respect, I see our role in the European Parliament. I work also with, 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 with a coalition, cross-party coalition, with many members of the European Parliament on these stronger sanctions. It's also our role to push, to push, push, push. And I do think that we uh, achieved uh, some results. It was the European Parliament that started to call for this full energy boycott. If we wouldn't have done it, I'm convinced that we would now still be talking about coal. And yes, it's a weak boycott because it's a phasing out uh, in August, in August. Uh, but, uh, but at least something has been done. We are now moving on the oil, but we will keep pushing, pushing, pushing. So I see our role here not only linked to our formal competences, but also to a more uh, pushing uh, role. And, and with regard to the prisoners, um, this is also, and I think it was mentioned also by Frana, this is about continuously, continuously uh, showing support, letting them feel in Belarus these more than 1,200 political prisoners, letting them feel that we are there. I also adopted a uh, prisoner uh, and, and, and I, I uh, will uh, also uh, uh, send him a, a postcard uh, again. But uh, I think it's important that we continuously keep on showing this message of support to Belarus and to Ukraine, because also Natalia was right. This um, is now uh, a, a war that is about more uh, than just um, uh, the country um, uh, the war is, 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 is waged on now. I think also Franek said it, a victory for Ukraine in Ukraine becomes now essential also for Belarus, because uh, uh, otherwise um, uh, the, the problem will, will, will not be solved. So, um, so yes, that's, that's, uh, that's my role, and I will keep pushing. I will keep trying to find coalitions, build bridges, and yes, we need the member states, but we also need to get over this European disease, the European disease that member states inevitably at some point um, uh, start to uh, think too much about their own interests. We have to think European in unity, as Farnak also said, and we have to think two steps ahead because autocrats, whether they are inside the union or outside, uh, they do have a plan and they do have strategies and we need to be smarter and learn our lessons faster. Talking about interests, uh, Ruben Brekelmans, uh, sometimes in the Netherlands, if you follow the discussion about the gas boycotts uh, recently, it seems or you get the feeling that uh, the Dutch economy prevails over the lives of Ukrainians, to say it very boldly. Um, what's your reaction to this? Do, do, are, aren't we reacting very slow? 
I think on a European level that's true, uh, but it's not because of the Netherlands. So the Netherlands has been uh, pushing for stronger sanctions within the EU. Um, we, uh, as a parliament, have said that if there would be, if there is a boycott on oil or gas very soon, then we are willing to uh, bear the cost of that, although we know that they are very big. But if you look at our dependency on Russian gas, it is something that we can manage uh, if at, at some point it would or it would be reduced to zero uh, very soon. Uh, but we must also be, be honest, there are countries in the eastern part of Europe uh, which are dependent on Russian gas for 80, 85, 90 percent. Um, and unfortunately, they are uh, landlocked, so it's not that they can easily buy LNG uh, through, uh, through ships. Um, so yeah, they, they know that if there is a boycott uh, very soon, that their economy will be uh, basically will be destroyed. Um, so I do understand their position. I do understand that there are some countries in Eastern Europe that cannot go as fast as the Netherlands. Uh, but what you see now on oil, um, that, that Hungary is saying that they need a five-year time path, yeah, that's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. uh, they can they can make the transition much fast, much faster. And I think we should also try to get to a, a timeline for gas as well. Uh, and that might take. Uh, I think it will not be able. We will not be able on the European level to do that at the end of the year to make that a deadline like for for oil. Uh, but we should have an ambitious target, saying that, for example, in two or three years uh, we should. Uh, uh, reduce our dependency on Russian gas. Um, but yeah, we see now that uh, it, it didn't happen in the first weeks, but now Hungary, other countries as well, they, are, they know that they can block decisions like this, and they are using that as a lever in order to, for example, uh, make um, the European Union more lenient on rule of law. Um, we see the same now with Turkey uh, when it comes to uh, uh, Sweden and, um, and Finland with the NATO accession. They are also using that position in order to get other things done. Um, and I think we should stand up against that. We shouldn't uh, be blackmailed in this way. Do you Can I jump yeah. in? Yeah, I actually have a question for Thais and Ruben. You know, I'm, I'm really um, puzzled um, and genuinely curious um, about, you know, the Netherlands had a closer brushing with the war in Ukraine than any other European country. Um, with the MH17 shooting down of the Boeing. So you mentioned Ukrainian lives, but these were Dutch lives. Mm -hmm. um, do you think the Netherlands could have and should have done more in the aftermath of MH17 to push for sanctions on the European level or Union level? Do you think that was because imagine we would have been in a very different place today mm. if that was taken more serious. I don't want to imply that the Netherlands didn't take it seriously, but at the same time, it's amazing to be having this conversation now as if that hadn't happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think it, it doesn't get that much attention right now because me personally as a politician, but also others are very reluctant reluctant using that. Uh, it, it, it's now uh, eight years ago, almost eight years ago. It's a big tragedy. Um, we, we are still, of course, the legal process is still going very slow and, and taking place on different fronts. Um, but I don't want to use that strategy for any political purpose. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not using that in my political uh, discussions or in political debates. But I think we have been pushing for a strong response. We have been pushing for sanctions and we also uh, I think it got... But uh, since MH17 or more since, recently? No, since MH17 no. We, we, have, we have been doing that, but uh, I think uh, we as the Netherlands and other countries well, have been too naive in the sense that we thought as long as we keep trading with Russia and we keep uh, relations like that, uh, in the end it will uh, also improve their attitude towards us. Yeah? So, one will do handle that idea has also been part of our, of our uh, Dutch policies. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it has shown that that was a mistake and that we have been too naive in that. So in retrospect, we should have been much stricter after 2014. Uh, and that was, a, I think, a misjudgment by the Netherlands, but also by the rest of Europe. But does everyone right now uh, in your party agrees with this uh, new, like with, with uh, agreeing on that we have been naive? Because there are a, a lot of realist voices hmm. who actually say, say we have to keep on trading or we have to seek for a pragmatic solution, uh, I hear you saying something else. 
No, I, th I think uh, that that realism is is, um, is uh, I think everyone is is understanding that and is also um, agreeing on that. Um, I think what what you sometimes see in the discussions also when it comes to energy uh, sanctions is that. Uh, for example, the Labour Party is saying, if other countries do not want to join, let's then, uh, as the Netherlands, ha do an oil boycott ourselves. Uh, and then my party says that's not effective, not effective. Uh, if you do it as a single country or with a group of countries. Um, so there is the discussion. It's more about what type, what is an effective approach. Um, but this, this realism and this idea that also we are talking now about Russia, but we could have the same discussion on China. We always thought if we keep t trading with China, then they will also become more open, more liberal, more adopting our standards, and that's that's simply not true. Uh, and you I know, Amit, it's, it's so interesting you say all of that, and I'm, I'm really interested in to hear what Thay says, but um, the MH17 was, all, you know, sometimes referred to as the, the Dutch 9-11, right? Mm -hmm. No American politician would have any worries about using 9-11 to justify policies and push for different policies as they have done, sometimes disastrously. Mm -hmm. um, so... Um, I mean, is that justified to say, don't you also owe it to the victims' families to make sure that, I mean, after all, this is an example of how a conflict, um, you know, kind of further away from your borders can create such an unstable world that it affects you. And uh, is it... Are you abusing the victims by, by talking about this? No, no, but I, I think... Uh, as, as a small country, I think we have done um, what we could in that respect, and we have been uh, pushing all other, also France and, and, and Germany. We were always even even more pragmatic or constructive toward Russia. We have been encouraging them, also Prime Minister Rutte personally, with Angela Merkel, to take a tougher stance against Russia. Uh, there have been European sanctions, so I think a lot has been done. Of course, we have also, on the legal front, we have also been pushing for uh, different uh, legal ways in order to keep to um, hold um, the, 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 um, the, the ones who were involved in this accountable. And so I think we, we have done, uh, as a small country, what we, what we could in that respect. Um, and, but, but of course, uh, it, it was also like now it's very also it, it's clear what Russia has done. Of course, they have invaded Ukraine. We know that Putin is responsible for it. But around MH17, there was also, of course, this fog of you know who was responsible, who has actually done it. Is it done by um, uh, was it done by a Russian uh, missile? Was it done by um, uh, you know Russian forces? Or so th there was of course this, this whole propaganda making it more. Um, yeah, make it more ambiguous than the situation is right now. But to answer your question, I think we have done what we could. Also, if you talk to our Prime Minister Mark Rutte, he always says that he's now Prime Minister of 12 year. This was the moment that had the most impact on him personally and made him realize that we, how vulnerable we are indeed uh, towards Russia. Um, so I, I don't think that, also I, I sometimes talk to, uh, to the, um, to the not to, of course not to the victims, but the family members who are still very active. Um, and they are not saying that the Netherlands is not doing enough. Even after mm -hmm. eight years, we are every day still trying to, especially with uh, all the legal processes that are taking place, to make progress on that. Maybe just shortly to ask the same question to Thijs, would you agree in retrospect that we did as the Netherlands enough after uh, MH17? Well, what, what the Netherlands did right at the time was to build that unity. Uh, because the Prime Minister then, still the Prime Minister, but also Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Frans Timmermans, at the time, uh, went to the UN, uh, and, he, and they also created this European coalition, which not only included the European member states, but also, obviously, Australia, but also all the countries that, uh, that align with the Euro European foreign policy. And up to date, there still is, in every declaration about the MH17, the precise same wording. Netherlands fought hard for that. But the harsh reality is that uh, not only in the Netherlands there has been naivety about uh, the Dutch, uh, uh, the, the, the Russian uh, autocratic uh, uh, ambitions, but also it, at the time it was simply uh, not uh, the atmosphere in the rest of Europe to push further for uh, more strong sanctions, especially from some countries that were men mentioned already by, by, by Ruben. Uh, and I think that, that what we are learning and we learned, started learning as the, in the Netherlands also from 2014 with the Kremlin narratives that 
were pushed and 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 uh, into into the to the Dutch uh, public opinion as well. Uh, I, I followed the discussion from Natalia on the previous uh, segment of of the day program and the disinformation, the propaganda. We we also own that, especially in Western Europe. I mean, the Baltic countries are more. Um, more resilient uh, in that respect, but we had to learn also a les lesson on disinformation and uh, propaganda. But I think that we did and do pay tribute uh, to uh, to the victims and to their families. Uh, and uh, well, we should not uh, uh, instrumentalize it. I agree fully with, with with Ruben on that. But I think that what we're doing today is also partly um, uh, showing that we uh, are. Uh, although uh, too slow, but we are learning our lessons, uh, and uh, and so in that respect, the 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 the, the MH17 story um, is indeed relevant also today. Franek, to ask you, do you think these uh, package of sanctions are enough? Of course, <laughs> of, uh, enough on uh, on MH17 or uh, no? On uh, now at this moment on uh, so, uh, no, Ukraine. Uh, until until uh, energy blockade uh, happens, it's not enough. We will see the result only when uh, our all allies will impose ban on oil products, so oil and gas. Then it will be enough, and then it will be felt by uh, Putin's regime. Uh, in regards of Belarus, it's interesting that there are two six packages right now, Russia and uh, Lukashenko's regime. Uh, I believe that Lukashenko's regime can fall down before Russian. Uh, there are people who believe that Lukashenko will survive uh, until Putin collapses, but I am not so optimistic about Lukashenko. Um, and uh, he is much more vulnerable, fragile, and any lifting sanctions right now which has been discussed about uh, in, in regards of food um, delivery, uh, that would be a very, very bad uh, message. Mm -hmm. And this will help Lukashenko to, uh, to stay for another year. So uh, we are asking, of course, to focus on Putin, but synchronize sanctions with sanctions mm -hmm. on Belarus, uh, make them a bit different. They can be same by strength, but different by structure, since economy structure in Belarus is different. Mm -hmm. Basically, you need to sanction the state sector in order to hit Lukashenko. Because private sector, especially small, medium enterprises, they are, uh, are anti-Lukashenko in most cases. But uh, state enterprises, state banks, they are fuel for the regime. And most of them are still not uh, under sanctions. Mm -hmm. And maybe we can say uh, or talk a bit about uh, on the desired outcome, because you said uh, for Lukashenko to collapse, for Putin to collapse. Do you think you have the the hope for the same outcome as uh, the European Union has? Like, what should be the outcome? Regime change in Belarus, regime change in Russia. Maybe the European Union only wants to stop uh, death uh, or to stop the conflict. Then it's a whole different aim you have with imposing certain sanctions. Uh, I believe that without uh, dismantling the regime, mm -hmm. war won't stop. And we should realize that for Putin, it is, uh, it is perhaps the last battle. Uh, he put everything on, on, on the table. Stakes are very high as never before. So without dismantling the regime, the system as it is right now, it will be difficult to, to prevent such cases. Yes, it can freeze for a while, for a year or two, this war. But without uh, dismantling the system, it will uh, arise again and again. Same about Lukashenko. You can't change anything um, until Lukashenko is uh, actually in power there. Uh, thanks God he's fragile and secure. Um, uh, so we just have to, to make another strong hit on him. Would you agree, uh, Ruben Brekomans, that the aim also of the sanction of the European Union and is to dismantle the regime of Putin? Um, uh, so the aim is, is to weaken Russian's economy and also to make sure that, that Russia becomes less able to finance this war. Um, I'm very hesitant as a politician to call for regime change in another country because the question then, of course, I is... could try. Biden <laughs> wasn't. <laughs> no, Biden, Biden wasn't in with, with slip. But, you know, the question then, of course, is how far are you willing to go in order to... Uh, and, and I don't think that we in any way should militarily uh, attack uh, Russia in order to, to uh, create regime change or anything. So, but how far are you willing to go then? I'm, I'm uh, as far to go as, as uh, Ukraine wants to go in order to defend their own territory and to get back their own territory. So if Ukraine says uh, we want to fight 
uh, to get every inch of our country back, then I think we should support Ukraine Including along Crimea. the way. Including Crimea. If they say that they want this, then I think we should uh, support them. If they say at some point uh, they want to stop the war and they are open for any type of settlement, and it also means that we, as the European Union, also need to negotiate with Putin, I think we should follow Ukraine. I don't mm -hmm. think then we should at that point restrict Ukraine in any way. They are fighting a war now, so they are in the lead. Uh, this uh, Monday evening, we have uh, Robert D. Kaplan here in the Bali also about this topic. And um, he said before, Zelensky is received with standing ovations, receives completely unrealistic promises for European accession, and then returns to the battlefield in solitude. Don't we just need a, a, a pragmatic solution? What do you think, Thijs Reuten? A pragmatic solution to what? To the conflict in Ukraine. Well, I, I'm actually pretty worried about what I hear from coming from some countries that are actually paying lip service to Kremlin narrative, uh, almost one on one. I agree with the last statement that was made by uh, Ruben. We, uh, we need to support uh, Ukraine um, uh, as long as they want uh, to continue this fight because they have to win it. It's not this, this very complex, this, this whole uh, infiltration of some 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 other narratives also in our public opinion because uh, previously people said no Russia should lose but does that also mean that Ukraine should win uh, no Ukraine must win this war because it's a war about our values and yes Ukraine is still a long way from uh, uh, from the same level uh, uh, that that we are at uh, in the European Union in terms of membership but the fact that they aspire to these democratic values, that they aspire to become member of the European Union, is a huge compliment for the European Union, as, as are the ambitions of uh, Moldova and, of course, the Western Balkan countries. Geopolitical uh, Europe has changed uh, after the 24th of February, and maybe before, but we didn't realize it. So now that we cannot uh, ignore it anymore, we should also um, uh, adopt a different attitude. And, um, yes, I, I understand that that does not mean that uh, Ukraine will become a member of the European Union next year. But we should get rid of a little bit of that, um, uh, how do you say that, a hesitation on uh, speaking about these aspirations, speaking about a candidate status. We have to carefully uh, address that also with the Western Balkan countries that are waiting much longer and are even uh, sometimes a bit further uh, ahead already in the process. We need to carefully address that, carefully uh, create a new strategy on that. There have been several proposals recently uh, launched uh, for that. Uh, but yes, I do think that um, that um, that we need to um, to to think differently also about uh, this and discuss this very very um, very uh, urgently. Uh, Natalia, do you think we have to agree that we have to be careful? You know what's interesting is. Um, I mean, I completely understand when politicians don't want to call for regime change. I think that's wise. Uh, but what's interesting is that there is no consensus on what it actually means for Ukraine to win the war. And can Ukraine win the war if Putin stays in power? Because obviously for countries like Moldova, like Georgia, Putin staying yeah. in power, even if Ukraine... Um, you know, gets its territory back is is kind of a is a death sentence. Um, so it's that consensus about like what 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 is it actually? What does the Ukraine victory actually look like? I genuinely don't understand what it looks like. And I think, you know, if I were Vladimir Putin, my best bet right now would probably be to freeze this conflict and buy some time and keep looking for loopholes and build up relations with China more and but, do all of those things. So, but yeah, well, a, a, a conflict that is frozen, uh, uh, it largely depends on what uh, the situation of freezing is. But then, then it is important what we do. Are we going then to massively uh, arm uh, uh, the free part of Ukraine? Are we going to maybe ahead of that guarantee some parts of the Ukraine uh, um, with, 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 we need to also not shy away uh, from, uh, from really, really saying what our objectives are. And yes, it is going to be difficult, but there are several outcomes that also mean a victory for, uh, for Ukraine, because a victory for Ukraine could also be having the upper hand at, uh, at some kind of negotiating table. But that, at the moment, is not 
in play. And that is the mistake that many politicians also in some European countries are making. They think that there is someone to negotiate with. And that simply is not on the menu. There is no one to negotiate with. Uh, so until then, until there is someone to negotiate with in a serious way, uh, we, we have to say, as Ruben Brekelmans uh, said clearly, we need to support Ukraine uh, in every uh, inch of territory they want to fight for, including the Crimea. Mm. Ruben Brekelmans, you're also a um, member of the NATO Parliamentary Commission. What do you think of the application of Finland and uh, Sweden to NATO recently? I, I very much support that. I think it makes uh, both Finland and Sweden uh, stronger and safer, and also it's good for our security, mm -hmm. uh, for NATO, especially if you look at Finland, they have a very strong army, very much uh, focused uh, on the Russian threat, so a very strong land force, also a very strong intelligence position. So I think they will uh, strengthen and enrich NATO, and they meet all the criteria, not only in terms of, of the, uh, the army, but also in terms of uh, democracy, uh, values, uh, rule of law, and everything. Um, so I, in, in Parliament, and, and basically uh, a big majority said, let's make sure that we uh, do this approval process as soon as possible. Uh, last time with Montenegro, it took uh, over a year. Of course, completely different situation. Uh, but now I think, I think we need to make sure that it doesn't take that long and that we approve it very fast. And how do you think uh, Franek Putin will react to this if they would, be, if they would join NATO? Oh, I, I would like to see what uh, <laughs> happens in Putin's head. I'm not trained uh, no. enough. Um, uh, so, um, uh, definitely, definitely Putin uh, lost already um, in terms of uh, uh, communications, in terms of uh, uh, political standing, of influence. He really believed in a blitzkrieg. This is my personal feeling. And everything what uh, he promised to Lukashenko, it was like a very quick war, a very big victory, a very nice parade. And Lukashenko and Putin really believe that before May 9, they will be uh, marching as victors and uh, Europe will uh, recognize this uh, quick uh, success. And uh, right now, Putin uh, didn't manage uh, to uh, to have a blitzkrieg. Uh, Ukrainian bravery was absolutely incredible. Um, and as a result, Putin received Finland and uh, Sweden as the NATO members. This is the huge loss. Even for Russian population, I think Putin lost a lot of points. Perhaps they don't feel it yet, but it will be felt very, very soon. And many, many other countries, uh, silently, uh, even post-Soviet countries, they are looking at, at Sweden and, and Finland right now, and they are thinking about their own security. I am sure such discussions are taking place in Kyrgyzstan, for example. That's right. Yeah. In Kazakhstan, in as, Kazakhstan. as well. Mm -hmm. They will put much more efforts. They don't have NATO, and I think they are not expecting to be there, but building their own alliances, strengthening their own armed forces, this will be task for everyone who has a uh, common border with Russia. I want to go to the audience, but ask one uh, question for the for both the politicians. Is there anything you heard this evening, or maybe anything new, where you're going to act upon? Um, no, I, Enforcing enforcement of sanctions definitely, uh, I, and, and what I really hope, and we are already in touch, but also for me as a member of parliament, it's because it gets into so much detail. And you, you mentioned the number of, of, of products, so and there are also so, sorts of smart ways to work around them. So I also need this input uh, from people like you who are experienced and working on this on a daily basis in order to. You know, uh, encourage our uh, ministers to enforce those sanctions better. Uh, I think one thing I would like to add, you said if we have this gas, um, this full gas package, then that's kind of the end of the, of the sanction um, um, range or the end of the sanction spectrum. I think we should also look at ways in order to distort Russian trade with other countries. Um, so, for example, with China, with India, with others. Uh, one, one example, for example, it's, it's, it's a small one, but it's about um, ensuring oil tankers. 
So you have these big oil ships, they need to be insured, and it's normally those are this done by big uh, Western insurers or big Western banks. So if we sanction uh, that those financial products, then you not only uh, hit Russian trade with Europe and with the US, but also with China, India, and, and we should look at, at, at sanctions, smart sanctions like that. Also, secondary sanctions is can we indirectly also put more pressure on countries like China and others in order to have them reducing their trade with Russia. Um, because the longer it takes all these sanction packets, Russian will find ways to um, displace trade from Europe and the US to other parts of the world. Uh, so that I think should be our next focus of attention. Thank you. Thijs Reuter. Well, from Natalia, my takeaway is that I'm uh, uh, going to uh, read more of her because I'm very interested in what she said also on the other side <laughs> on, on this information and propaganda. Uh, I think that's very important to, to get very much more resilient uh, uh, to uh, in, in general. And uh, from Franak, yes, well, on the, on the boycott on the gas, I'm already working. We will keep pushing. But what I take away from his, uh, his um, uh, contributions is the that we need, uh, actually, we did already adopt a resolution on fo food security, but we need to be more um, uh, active, more creative on uh, avoiding this um, weaponizing of uh, food, because that also harms um, uh, another narrative uh, that is now pushed, and, and that is the, uh, the global south, because some countries use uh, the food crisis that will obviously also spread in, onto other countries, other parts of the world in Africa, as an excuse to do less, we actually need to do more. We need to do more to uh, avoid and to uh, circumvent the, 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 the weaponization of food, but also uh, engage more with Africa, for example, uh, um, uh, much stronger than we are doing now um, uh, to, to also cut off uh, Chinese and also Russian influence, for example, to the Wagner uh, group. It's incredible what is happening also also there and that is linked also to that food um, security point so i really take that away from franak's uh, words thank you we're going to follow your actions closely mm -hmm. um are there any questions well, I'm especially reading yes <laughs> <laughs> we have to wrap up here but there is a third round at the bar so we can uh, drink and discuss and ask a, a lot of questions uh, i want to thank everyone uh, for being here the speakers uh, Thijs Reuter, Ruben Brekomans, Natalia Antelava and uh, Franak Viachorka thank you very much for being here I want to thank the audience here and at home and uh, we would also like to thank Ilya Sharbitsky, Dasha Slabchanka, Tasha Arlova and Lena Davidovic the Belarusian journalist activist and artists in uh, collaboration with whom we made this whole day on Belarus. So uh, thanks a lot to you all. And for the people watching from home, have a very good evening and hope to see you next time. <laughs>